cyclones, worsening drought, flooding. But also determination, innovation and cooperation. With nine out of ten of the countries in the world most vulnerable to climate change coming from the continent, Africa already faces a particularly stark threat from the crisis and is heating up faster than anywhere else. But Africa is not willing to give up on its history, heritage and heroism just yet. And the world certainly can't afford it to do so. So here in Accra, Ghana's capital, the African Development Bank has got key voices together in person for the first time since 2019. And they're coordinating a fight back, making and demanding the changes that will ensure that the continent doesn't just survive, but thrives. The race is on to make African development climate resilient. Now this huge highway is the first of its kind in West Africa. It opened just last year and cost $95 million as part of a project that was funded by the African Development Bank and the Ghanaian government. Now as well as bringing positive economic changes for the people of Accra, the way that it was built and even financed took into account the social impact and sustainability credentials that are becoming increasingly important to African investment. So if you see the sacred group over there, we had to fence it because it is an ecological site, it's a historical site, and we didn't want there to be too much intrusion in there and make sure that the impact of cars moving up and down the, the interchange was not felt on the, uh, on the forest because that forest also contributes in the reduction of CO2 in the project area. This project helps reduce traffic. Two, up, two and a half hours of traffic have been reduced to 30 minutes. We saw that there were difference in levels. The place was flood prone. There was a sacred groove that we needed to protect. We are focused on not just doing infrastructure. We are focused on doing climate resilience infrastructure to be able to to, uh, take the impact of climate change and be able to withstand cl climate change and still be effective and useful in years to come. Why is tackling climate change so important for Africa? The adverse effects of climate change is felt most on this continent because of the infrastructure deficit that we have. So it's important for us to structure our funding and our resources to make sure that we have an infrastructure that can help us be able to uh, mitigate the impact of the adverse uh, uh, nature of climate change. So it's in, for us in Africa, it's important for us to tackle the issue. When, when you come to the infrastructure sector, how can you make sure that it is not contributing to the problem, but rather solving the problem. Africa has contributed the least to the carbon emissions that have triggered climate change, it still has to find ways of keeping them down whilst allowing room for development. One of the ways that Rwanda has chosen to do so is to clamp down on the use of single-use plastics. Our correspondent sent us this report. Rwanda has set a goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2050. Today, authorities are encouraging taxi drivers to go electric. Regis took the plunge a few months ago. The fact that this bike pollutes less made me switch. I'm also saving much more money. I spend less for repairs, and now electricity is cheaper than fuel. The government wants 30 percent of motorcycle taxis to go electric by 2030, but there is still a long way to go. Today, Less than a thousand motorcycles are equipped with a battery. For waste, the challenge is just as important. Though the country banned single-use plastic in 2019, the law is yet to be fully applied. These plastic bottles are banned by law. The country has accepted that if we can find recovery and recycling alternatives, we can continue to use them. For now, the company is compressing these bottles to store them while waiting to find economic outlets. 
Despite this, the country appears as a pioneer on the subject internationally. This year, they brought a resolution to the United Nations with Peru on plastic pollution. So when you have a treaty of this sort, it is not only tackling pollution, but it is also uh, tackling the limited availability of alternatives. It is also tackling the technologies that need to be in place. It is also tackling financing and finances needed for countries to implement this kind of instrument. Rwanda aims to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 38% by 2030. Together, we will build a more equitable growth and development from the middle-income countries to the low-income countries and to the fragile states. No development of any country will be left behind. So here at the African Development Bank's annual general meeting, leaders have got together to discuss how to fund the continent's climate adaptation and recovery. The pandemic and the war in Ukraine have dealt a huge blow to a region that, in terms of growth, had been moving in the right direction. It'll take a huge amount of money and planning to make sure that climate change does not shortchange Africa's economies. Africa suffers seven to 15 billion dollars per year in losses to climate change, which are projected to rise to 40 billion dollars per year by 2030. Africa has no choice but to adapt to climate change that it did not cause. To support the continent in doing so, the African Development Bank has doubled its financing for climate to $25 billion by 2025. Climate change is Africa's biggest challenge. Coastal erosion, changing weather patterns, drought, all have had a devastating impact, and it's often the poorest who are the worst hit. Land and water have to be managed more sustainably if they're going to keep on supporting the natural systems upon which human civilization relies. Because of climate change, Africa's facing a very real water crisis. About one in three Africans are currently reckoned to be facing some kind of water scarcity. As well as looking at new policies and new technologies, climate scientists and environmentalists are trying to get people looking more closely at the way that they use water in agriculture, at home, but also by facing the amount of pollution being allowed to flow into water sources. For Professor Céline Pollé, a river expert in Kinshasa, field trips are always a distressing sight. You see this canal here? It's filled with human feces and it flows directly into the river, which itself flows into the Congo River. Across the city, thousands of tonnes of plastic, organic and industrial waste clog waterways and rivers. This team of chemists carries out regular measurements to assess the impact of this pollution on the environment. We are monitoring the level of oxygen. You see that it drops very quickly. When the concentration falls below one, it means the river is asphyxiated. So you won't find any fish living here. River pollution is not only an ecological disaster, but also a major threat to human health. Detailed analysis of water samples has revealed the presence of disease-causing bacteria, antibiotics, and even heavy metals such as lead and mercury. Researchers from the University of Kinshasa have also found that some of these substances end up in wells and streams used for drinking water. We are trying to sound the alarm, to raise awareness, so that people understand that their activities have an impact on public health. The local government says sanitation is a top priority. A plastic waste recycling plant with a daily capacity of 50 tonnes was inaugurated in April and a wastewater treatment plant is due to open in the coming months. We are accelerating the construction of these water treatment centres. I believe that we will complete the first phase soon. 
The site will be operational this summer. I am convinced that from the moment we see this waste as raw material, as a resource, the city will clean itself and it will be automatic. Around 10,000 tonnes of waste are produced every day in Kinshasa, of which less than 10% is collected by authorities. Like its rivers and waterways, much of Africa's coastline is choked with plastic pollution. Yeah, so, I mean, as you can see, a lot of waste being washed ashore from the sea, which is posing a very serious problem for people in the community, especially the fisher folks, you know, who depend on the fishes or the sea for their source of livelihood. Chibese Ezekiel is an award-winning Ghanaian environmental activist. Well, I think that um, one major deficit or one major challenge we have now is people not being aware of the consequences of their actions or inactions. For some of them, they are living their normal life, but they forget that it has some consequences at the long run. So whilst at the policy level, you know, political leaders, policymakers are beginning put in place policies to address climate change, we fail to also bring on board the communities or the local people because they also have a major role to play in that process. So I think that um, whilst people uh, must be given a room or the chance to live the way they want to live their life, they must also be reminded that their actions or inactions can also actually lead to compound the climate crisis or can to confound with. So it's about how do we engage them? How do we bring them on board? that some of these things we see around us, all this pollution, is as a result of bad practices. So how then do we inform them that what you are doing is likely to have an impact on you yourself, and therefore you must see yourself as an actor to help resolve this problem, which in the long run will also help address the climate crisis. So that for me, that's where we need to link the, the community people and also the policymakers at the, at the Africa level, if you like. Now, you're a, a big uh, clean energy advocate. Yeah. Uh, what are you particularly worried about and what is it that you're hoping to see change in Ghana or across Africa? Well, um, in terms of energy, um, in principle, I do agree that if you talk about industrialization, Africa needs energy to industrialize. But uh, we are found torn between two options. Do we use fossil fuel or we go clean? But from where I sit, I think that going clean is better, even though uh, we hear there is, it's a more cost intensive and all that. But the long term benefits shows that clean energy is far better. Even for people living in such communities, you know, who are basically fisher folks, uh, women into smoking. Um, if you look at even what they use in smoking you the fish. You mean smoking fish? Smoking fish. If you see the device they use in smoking fish, um, it actually creates a lot of impact on them, on their health. Because some of them are still using the old forms of uh, equipment or devices. And if in, the, in the course of smoking the fishes, they end up inhaling the smoke, which creates cancer, lungs challenges, etc. So how then do we address this energy issue among these women, at the same time also fighting the climate change? So for me, I think that um, in this community, people must be supported to shift from this old device to cleaner forms of cooking. We have clean cooking stoves we can be a better form of energy or a better form of device for them to, sh to smoke the fish as against the use of the old you know, um, stoves that they are they're used to. That's even at the local level. At the national level also, I believe strongly that we can also actually shift gradually to clean energy like solar energy, wind energy, geothermal, as against the use of gas or coal plants, you know, as we were, we, were, we were planning to do as a country years ago. Land degradation is a huge issue across Africa, and the destruction of natural habitats and biodiversity makes us more vulnerable to the emergence of new diseases. Our well-being depends on healthy ecosystems. Sam Bradpiece sent us this report from Senegal. The Infectious Diseases Unit at this Dakar hospital is one of the largest on the continent. Climate change means they are increasingly treating illnesses like dengue fever that just 10 years ago were extremely rare. The first step in providing a diagnosis is to do a blood test. We have all kinds of illnesses here. When we admit a patient, we do a test. We then send it to a laboratory. After two or three days, we receive the results. The vials are sent to Dakar's Pasteur Institute, which analyzes samples from dozens of African countries. Its director said he was worried about the impact of climate change on public health. 
Heavy rains and higher temperatures mean that vectors like mosquitoes have longer lifespans, increasing the risk of disease transmission. And this is only the beginning. If the trend continues, diseases that were much more present in forests will find themselves increasingly in urban settings. That will mean we need to rethink the entire dynamic for containing these diseases, which is very important. Dr. Moussa Dian has already discovered one new disease through his research with the Institute. His lab has the capacity to analyse up to 5,000 samples a day and could soon play a crucial role in the development of new medical treatments. Sequencing allows us to have a very precise perspective on the genome and will allow us to design vaccines and prophylactic methods that are more and more effective because they are targeted on specific mutations or specific genes of a pathogen. While the work of the Pasteur Institute is vital, so is addressing climate change itself. Scientists warn that despite the African continent contributing very little in terms of global greenhouse gas emissions, it's set to be at the forefront of the looming epidemiological disaster. Climate change is not theoretical, climate change is not far away. Africa is dealing with its devastating consequences in the here and now. The next big date for global discussions about Africa's climate change challenges will be in Egypt at COP27 later this year. Some are even calling it the African COP. Global warming is worldwide, but Africa is the most vulnerable. Its governments can do more, its people can do more, but climate justice demands that there be international cooperation in tackling this existential threat.